Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's another episode of the Diff Podcast, where we are going behind the scene of open source. And with me today is Pascal. So, Pascal, can you please introduce yourself so our listeners know uh, what the episode is about? Hi, Dimitri. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. So, I guess I can just start in the beginning. So, I joined Facebook back in 2016, and I moved over from Twitter, where I first joined as a software engineer working on TweetDeck. And yeah, then in 2016, I joined Facebook back then, what it was called, now Meta, of course, and I joined the Litho team. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. You mentioned Litho, and I believe Litho is one of the open source projects at the, again, as you mentioned, Facebook back then released, and now it's Meta. But can you talk more about your involvement with the open source uh, at Meta in the past, that the, when you just joined? Yeah, absolutely. So Litho, for those of you who don't know, and I don't expect you to, is a UI framework for Android. So it is very much inspired by React. So you also have the model of components, you have state, you have props. That was practically the first thing I did on the team. So what? The, so that was one of the reasons why I wanted to join the team so urgently, because like, oh my God, this is such a big deal, open sourcing this framework, which did exactly what I always wanted to have when I build Android apps for myself, something that feels a little more functional, is not that imperative with kind of mutating props all over the place. So I definitely wanted to be involved. And yes, it was a lot of fun. And to that point, I mean, there's so many things to unpack here, but was it one of the, as you said, major reasons why you joined that particular team? And I know it's, uh, at, back then at Facebook, we could kind of uh, pick and choose what teams we joined, but for you, was it one of the major uh, reasoning, the open source involvement? Why you chose oh, for the sure. Team? Open source is one of the major reasons why I'm here today. It really got me into the industry and got me involved and taught me so much. So it also felt like a good opportunity to give something back to the community in that sense. But also, as you mentioned, what is really cool about Litho and looking back is how unremarkable it really is today. It was just the one declarative UI framework that was out there back then. And today you have so many to choose from. You have Swift UI from Apple, for instance, which nobody would have imagined back then that I would go completely all in on the declarative model. Google has released Compose. We actually worked a little with them on this, or at least had chats, not, not that we contributed any code to the Google repository, <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong on this. But so we had chats about it because they looked at what we had built with Litho and were kind of curious about the learnings we had on the team and how they can build on top of it. So it's really cool to see these kind of cross-company industry efforts that could not be possible without open source. How do you avoid um, going into the weeds too much of uh, trying to make a perfect framework? How do you figure out what to focus on when it comes to open sourcing? What to prioritize? One of the big differences in open sourcing a project to how you approach most work at Facebook is that in this particular case, we had a very firm deadline. That was F8. We wanted to announce it at F8. We had blog articles written. We had talks prepared. We wanted to have somebody on stage and announce it. And we can't just kind of walk up to Zuck and say like, ah, yeah, sorry, but we need to add this kind of additional build system to this framework we want to open source. Could you just kind of push back the, the entire conference by a couple of weeks? Can you hold the audience for like a minute or so? Let me <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that wasn't really an option for us. And normally it's it's really all about kind of delivering incremental value here at Meta. It's like, how can we break down a large effort into small parts where it's not just some big bang release at the end of a large project, but something where people benefit from what we build throughout the process. So that wasn't possible here. So we just kind of decided in the beginning that Gradle support probably won't make it. So it wasn't that we just realized at the last minute that we don't have it. It was more like, well, we can either try and ship something or nothing. And uh, as the rest of it then suddenly looked like it was actually available, and I still had a weekend, and I was actually at my parents at that point, had my laptop with me. So I was like, why don't you just kind of hack this together now? And I'm sure a lot of people will actually benefit from this. Again, you, you have a full-time job, and then often full open source is done by folks after, full, after their jobs. And they have families, they have themselves as well. It's, yeah, it's definitely it's so important to keep work-life balance in mind. And I'm excited that you are uh, conscious of that and you're trying to keep up with that. You mentioned Flipper, you know, uh, another project, uh, I believe, from Meta Open Source. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so this is one of the projects that is owned by my team. And we have effectively two different arms inside this team. So one is focused on self-sufficiency, and that involves 
everything to help users, specifically off frameworks, to help themselves and help supporting these teams. So that's the self-sufficiency side. The other side is a bit more self-explanatory. It's developer efficiency. You probably have some ideas what this means. This can be stuff like build times. Super important. Being able to iterate on your application and make, making quick changes is just absolutely vital if you want to have a good developer efficiency. But it's also about stuff like debugging. And that brings me then to Flipper. So Flipper is a tool that has kind of outgrown this space where it's easy to give it one particular tagline, but one that covers about 90% of what people use it for is a extensible mobile debugging platform. And the mobile is a bit tricky, but what people use it for the most is effectively when you think of the Chrome DevTools that you point at any given website and inspect it. This is what Flipper is, but for mobile applications. We have basically three different layers of plugins or levels. The first one is a device plugin. And that basically means you inspect something about the state of the device, of the entire thing. It could be something like looking at how busy are my CPU cores, or it could be how much memory is my application using. Then we have infrastructure plugins. So this is something kind of broad that still affects a specific application, but in a rather broad sense. So something like looking at the network requests, looking at the layout tree. There it's really important that you can actually look at the specifics that a framework might introduce. So with Flipper, because we can extend it, you can build your own plugins, you're able to not only look at the different components that a given view that you might otherwise see is composed of, but you can also look at the props, so the React model behind it. And even better, you can edit them in real time and just kind of play around with the margins, with the colors, so all the kind of stuff that you would know from the standard Chrome DevTools when you play around with the CSS properties in there. And then lastly, there's something very product specific that you can build. This is not like a specific type of plugin that you need to build, but just to kind of put them into different buckets. There could be something that you build for your specific product. So if you imagine the watch tab on the Facebook app, for instance, if you're the watch team, you might want to understand, hey, why is this video showing up here at the top? So why was it ranked like this? And if you're the watch team, you might want to invest into a Flipper plugin that allows you to kind of break down the different recommendation arguments that inform why a video shows up at the top. And you can imagine this for pretty much every single feature. There's always something kind of behind the view, behind the pixels that you see on your screen. And having a specific plugin to help you analyze this and break it down can be super helpful. What excites you the most about open source? Is it the community or is it just getting the contributions and improving your uh, code base, uh, trying to get to your use cases? or actually just adoption. What's in it for you, really? What's the most exciting thing for you? So I, I feel like I personally owe a lot to open source. I almost certainly wouldn't be here in this interview today if it wasn't for open source. It's really the thing that connected me with so many people, that taught me so much. But it was really this, um, this feeling that anybody can go there. You can freely share everything. So for me, it's really about just wanting to retain these open principles that have allowed me to be here today. So we are basically at the end of our, our episode. Uh, I have one question that really for you and uh, to summarize everything we've talked about, what would be your advice to someone who's just starting an open source? These days, what is really cool is that GitHub in particular has a feature where you can actually look at issues that are marked as newcomer issues. We use this tag and probably haven't done a great job recently, but we should do this again. But we just have these, these small things where we might not have the time right now. We are also a fairly small team inside Meta, but where it's like, hey, it would be cool to have, again, like something like dark mode or have this kind of section here mm -hmm. cleaned up. And often it's really about getting your foot in the door. Just making this first contribution, overcoming this very first hurdle is so important. And this can be a contribution to documentation. It can be a small typo fix somewhere or something a bit meatier. Maybe you find an actual bug that you can fix. Open source maintainers love it if you yeah. find a bug and you just come immediately with a pull request for it. Obviously, no expectations. All of these things are valuable. But just trying something out. Yeah, just start somewhere, start small. Great, that's great advice. You know, always starting small. Um, you have to build a foundation before you can build a house. So. Uh, Thank you so much for this. You know, it was exciting for me, exciting interview. And again, thank you for joining me. Have a nice rest of your day. Thank yeah, you. thanks, Dimitri. Thanks for having me.